My name is Dwayne Clayton. This is Aaron Kite. And um, somehow we ended up on this panel. We thought we'd have more people to help us. So you're stuck with the two of us for the next four hours. Um, we could use poison to cut that back. <laughs> that's true. And I have some suggestions. OK. <laughs> Good. Uh, well, it'll be boring when everybody's snoring. And, and, uh, um, so uh, I'll just quickly introduce myself for those who you don't know. I'm Dwayne Clayton. I'm a paramedic. I started my career as a police officer and then I've been a paramedic in various places for a number of years. Uh, taught in the paramedic program at SAIT, was the academic coordinator at SAIT. And a couple of years ago, I did a talk on poisons. So if you're in that talk, you'll be the ones snoring in the back because I'm going to use some of those same notes again. So I'm going to take it kind of from the uh, medical street drug side of things. And then Aaron's going to take a little different uh, track on that. So I'll give it to Aaron. Be very different. I'm Aaron Kite. I'm a YA fantasy writer and a vandalizer of Shakespeare, as well as a graphic illustrator. And uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, haven't really done too many of these panels, so forgive me if I start trembling noticeably or vomiting in the corner. But uh, I will do my best. Well, I guess, I guess medically speaking, um, any drug, um, whether prescription or not, is a poison. So it's a foreign substance going into the body. Now there are obviously some medications that can be taken that are a little more natural, but they're a foreign substance coming into the body, and so they all are poisons. Now, the use of poisons to get rid of people goes back to biblical times, at least. I'm not going to go back quite that far. Um, but I'm going to talk just a little bit about the 19th century. And the 19th century um, was a time when forensics, as we know it, was absolutely non-existent. And actually, in 1976, it was probably um, non-existent, too. But in the 1900s, there really wasn't any tests to determine if somebody had been poisoned. So several drugs, cyanide, arsenic, were commonly used and were actually referred to as inheritance medication. So if you wanted to get rid of somebody, you could use cyanide or arsenic and uh, get rid of them. And, you know, if they were, well, I was going to say elderly, but in that time, life expectancy was probably not much more than 50 years of age. So, if, I mean, if they were over 50 and they died, nobody's going to be suspicious about that. That was just natural. And so um, they were gone. You got your inheritance and all was well. But then a couple of doctors in New York decided they would start looking into this. And this is really the start of forensics. And they came up with some tests to be able to determine if uh, these drugs had been used. And they further exhumed bodies and were able to go back a number of years and found out that these drugs remained in the bones. And they could prove murder years afterwards. So from that time on, it's really been a kind of a game of cat and mouse between murderers and forensics in that they'll come up with a new poison that can't be detected and we figure out how to detect it. And then they come up with a different drug that can't be detected and we detect it. And strangely enough, the biggest impetus to have, uh, to find out uh, what the drug is, didn't come from murders. Anybody know? Came from the Olympics, the Olympic Games. <laughs> so the biggest advances in forensics really, ha as, as, far, as far as determining foreign substances in the body, is with the Olympics. Um, because of all the drug testing and all the doping and everything that was happening. So there's been some tremendous strides in that. Now, along with that, forensic science has now become it, its own entity within all police departments worldwide and looking at specialties. But there's certainly you know, a trade back and forth that a, a test that works in one place will work in a, a different situation as well. Um, now, because you're here, you're, I'm assuming that everybody is as warped as we are as far as death and destruction goes. Um, but, I, but I have to say, my, my, favorite, my favorite poison movie is Arsenic and Old Lace. And if you haven't seen that movie, you've got to see that movie. That is the funniest movie going and, and t tongue in cheek about multiple murderers. Um, so, um, 
drugs can be administered, any poisons can be administered in any number of ways, just on the skin. Um, a simple pinprick into the skin through intravenous um, by the mouth can be inhaled. Uh, a number of years ago, there was a hostage situation, I can't remember exactly where it was, in, in Russia, and it was in a theater, and terrorists had taken everybody in the theater hostage, and the Russian military was called in, and they were trying to get the people out, and they couldn't figure out how to get everybody out safe. So what they decided to do was take a drug called fentanyl, which is a morphine-like drug. They aerosolized it, vaporized it, and put it into the theater. And so what this drug would do would make everybody unconscious. This had never been done before. And uh, unfortunately, whoever came up with what the dose should be was wrong. And they killed almost everybody in the theater with this fentanyl uh, vaporized gas. It was so. What's that? Sorry? Yeah. Uh, probably 15 years ago. 15 years ago, yeah. It was, it, was, it was hundreds of people were affected. I can't remember how many died. So I, I guess you know, the, the point for bringing that up is there's a number of ways it can happen. So you don't have to have you know, exact contact with a person. You can also you know, kill a, a lot of people at, at one time. Certainly terrorists uh, have tried to do that with, uh, with anthrax and ricin and some other um, poisons that, that, that they're trying to use without... Um, Fortunately, without a lot of success, but it's, it's possible. Well, eat an orange. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, and, and things that we didn't think were, uh, were, 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 were poison. Uh, these, these two scientists, or two physicians in New York in the 1900s, started looking into deaths of young girls and trying to figure out what it was. And I'm sorry I don't have all the details on the tip of my tongue, but their job was they walked in, worked in a watch factory and they painted the stuff that made the radium, radium, radium. radium. <clears throat> and so they painted it on the watch faces and then these girls started dying and nobody could figure out why they were dying and then they traced it back that they all worked in this watch factory and where their job was and what they were doing was in order to not be sloppy about it, they would take the brush, put the tip in their mouth to get it to a nice point, then they would dip it in the radium and paint the, you know, the, the slashes on the dial or, or the number. And then the next one, same thing. And that's how they were dying. These guys figured that out. Anyway, maybe I'll stop, stop now and I'll give uh, Aaron a chance here and we'll just kind of play back and forth for a bit and then we'll take some questions. Sounds good. Um, well, how this started, kind of like him, uh, found out there's a panel called Poison, thought there'd be more people here, uh, sort of in a support role, but I figured it was a good fit because uh, I've got a book, Touch Poison, launching 2 o'clock today, Yorkshire 3. Um, and because, I mean, obviously with a, a title like that, it's got some poison in it. I figure, well, I've written a book, it's got poison in it. <laughs> then I realized, wait, I've written two. Oh, wait, all of my books have poison in it. So this panel, thanks to this panel, uh, I have some new things to tell my therapist, <laughs> probably tomorrow. But when you're doing things like studying for, for writing and, and books, uh, you do a lot of research, sometimes online, sometimes you know, medical texts and books, but you start researching poison and you find out certain things like just how scary a place Australia is. I, I don't know if a lot of you are familiar with just how many poisonous critters are out there, and they're some of the most dangerous and poisonous in the world. Has anyone here heard of the blue ring octopus? Okay. <clears throat> are you familiar with how the poison works? And why, what makes them so dangerous? They're actually literally called the most dangerous poisonous creature on the planet. And it's because you get bitten by this particular octopus, it's about eight different chemicals all going into your bloodstream. Uh, there's histamines, there's taurine, there's a bunch of stuff, but the most dangerous is uh, a paralytic that actually causes all of the muscles in your body to shut down. If you get bitten by this thing and you're not given CPR within about two minutes, and that CPR has to be constant, 
until EMTs arrive to take over, to take you to a hospital where you're put on a ventilator and your blood is circulated for you for say the next 24 hours, you're, you're dead within about five minutes, however, t uh, however long it takes you to just stop getting oxygen to your brain. And even with the 24 hours, if they get to you in time, it's about 50-50 for the most part. It's just weird, nasty stuff. And these things are about this big. Blue ring octopus. Yes. They hang out by reefs. <laughs> <laughs> they are very, very cute. Yes. I do have to agree with that. Um, inland Taipei, same thing. It's the scariest land snake in the world. And wow, that poison does crazy, crazy stuff. I think only one person survived uh, a bite from it. And that's simply because they were a, a snake handler at a zoo. And I think it was in Melbourne. And they had the antivenin right there. So he was able to submit it as soon as he got bit, and afterwards they were able to say, great, it works. Because no one had ever survived a bite like that before. And he called it the most, uh, the most painful experience he'd ever been through, just surviving a bite from that. But um, another weird thing that I came across, and this was kind of unexpected, was that poison didn't necessarily mean what I thought. Um, when it comes to poisoning, there's this thing called uh, the LD50 scale, which is essentially the median lethal dose. What it is, is it's a measurement of how much of a substance can be introduced into the body before 50% of people that that amount has been exposed to have died. And they did it with mice. They didn't line up 100 volunteers and say, okay, <laughs> take this cyanide. Um, which also had its problems because it turns out that mice are about 50 times more resilient to the venom from a funnel spider than, uh, than humans are. So they actually started doing LD50 tests on human cells that they were culturing for the purposes of finding out when some of these things were happening and, uh, and what the LD50 was for that. But water is actually on the LD50 scale. I, I think you might have heard maybe about five years ago there was that uh, that radio contest that was happening where you were on a stage and participants had to drink a certain amount of water they couldn't go to the bathroom and if you didn't go wee you won a wee if you were the last one standing and a woman actually died as a result of drinking 7.5 liters of water and not having any sort of mechanism to let it out so water actually is is on the LD50 scale it's there's a way you can essentially poison yourself with water. But the way the LD50 scale works is the lower the score, uh, the more scary and dangerous the poison itself is. And you can go right from water to, I think at the bottom of the scale, you've got Botox, which it doesn't take a lot of that to just overload your system and kill you. So, I mean, we've been... I don't want to go with that. <laughs> um, we've got a, a huge history of using poison. I, I think in some cases they've tracked about to uh, 4500 BC or so, finding grooves in arrows and other weapons that were meant to contain something to disable. And I mean, th those sort of traditions are carried forward with uh, things like poison dart frogs and curare that are still used by some of the, the tribal uh, or, or natives, I guess, of certain countries that haven't had much exposure to the outside world and, and still operate much like they did, you know, 100,000 years ago. Well, not 100,000, but a 100 or 1,000 years ago. Uh, ancient India, there's Sanskrit documents, uh, instructions on how to poison well water and how to poison people over time. You know, the uh, buildup of poison as opposed to outright killing somebody right away. Uh, Egypt, 100 BC, there was uh, a chemical that they discovered that would disappear into water and create a fiery poison that could instantly kill people. Uh, Rome, poisoning at the dinner table was a fairly common thing. Sometimes method of choice was mushrooms brought in from some exotic locale that, you know, these are unfamiliar. I wonder what these taste like. And suddenly, no more dinner. Uh, it's prominent in stories and legends, too. I mean, one of the big reasons why, obviously, we're here is poison as it relates to writing. 
you know, and, and some of the tales of antiquity. You've got, you've got Shakespeare. Again, book launch, 2 o'clock, Yorkshire 3. <laughs> um, Romeo and Juliet. Uh, Romeo kills himself with poison. At, spoilers. At the very end. <laughs> um, Hamlet. You've got the sword fight with Laertes. You've got the poison goblet, again, with the spoilers. I'm sorry if anyone hasn't read it. But you've also got, you know, real life traditional example, or I guess we don't know that they actually happened. They're, they're passed down in folklore. You've got Cleopatra, who instead of being taken, decided to grab an asp from a basket and allow herself to be bitten multiple times, and, and she died. Hannibal of Carthage, I don't know if you've ever if you remember your history, Hannibal led his elephants over the Alps, so he could... Anyways, he was a very, very great general, and um, he had a lot of enemies, obviously, because he was so successful, and he had, or he re was reputed to have a poison ring that was given to him by his father that he wore with him, or wore on a finger at all times, and that was how they say he actually died, was that his enemies had finally caught up to him, and rather than be captured by an enemy and paraded through their streets. He scrawled a quick note, left it on his person, and took the poison out of the ring and killed himself. So I mean, there's, there's all sorts of different stories throughout history that have involved things like poison and various tropes and, and other whatnot. But the point is, <laughs> poison's really, really bad sometimes. And after a while, people decided that they really didn't like getting poisoned. And they took some steps to maybe try to stop such a thing from happening. Um, you had food tasters that were hired in Egypt and Rome and in, in some parts, kingdoms in the Middle East. And their job, their sole job, was to sample food that was going to be served to somebody important before they did to see if they would die from it. And if they did, then it's like, okay, take that meal away bring out the next guy <laughs> because I've got a steak coming no not really it, but um, you also had uh, those same ancient Sanskrit documents from India they had instructions or, or they had information on how to identify whether or not somebody was being slowly poisoned and how to remedy that particular poison so I mean people have been researching ways of stopping poisonings pretty much ever since they realized that they could use poison to kill people. Um, and one of the things that I found out about that was kind of important to me in, in the entire process of writing this particular book was Mithridatism, which involves Mithridates the sixth of Pontus, around 11, or sorry, it's uh, 100 BC. Uh, his father, Mithridates V was poisoned, and his brother was the better liked by his mother. And he sort of realized how much more she liked him because he started developing stomach pains every time he ate supper at the dinner table, and sort of realized that he was being poisoned by his mother, who wanted him to essentially die or abdicate, and so his brother could be king. And there's a whole story about him going into the wild and researching, basically coming up with a, a recipe or a formula of all these different poisons that he could slowly build up a resistance or tolerance to over time so that any attempt to poison him by any means would be unsuccessful because he'd be immune to them all. And it reportedly worked. It really, really did because he lived to be about 80 years old He's considered one of the greatest kings of Pontus, and, uh, and he was reputed to be immune to the poisons. When, when he died, and when I believe Rome sacked Pontus, his recipe was found and translated by the Romans, and it contained 700 different ingredients, including the blood of a duck that had been feeding on poisonous plants and had not died. They kept this duck around pulled blood out of it every now and then, and mixed it in with the 699 other things that were da very dangerous, very, very bad for you, and he drank it. And 
it's a practice that still survives to this day with uh, zoo handlers. It's particularly of interest for zoo handlers. They routinely expose themselves to the venom of the snakes that they're going to be handling because even if you develop partial resistance, like partial immunity, it, it does save you a great deal of discomfort and pain uh, later on. Uh, the effects of the venom are essentially minimized. Uh, you've got snake charmers. There are, who is it, sorry. It's in Myanmar. The snake handlers there actually get tattoos uh, that have their ink mixed with snake venom so that they can actually achieve full immunity for the particular snakes that they handle. And so, I mean, it's, it's a real thing. The only real caveat to that is that it has to be a naturally occurring poison. It can't be a chemical poison. Chemical poisons can build up in the body over time if they're not expelled, whereas the natural poisons, the ones that kind of attack you instantly and don't require a buildup, you can build up a resistance to anything, just like they're, they're treating peanut allergies now by slowly introducing a small amount of peanut into the diets of people that suffer from it, and then gradually getting more and more until suddenly they're essentially immune to this thing that was poisoning them before. Which kind of led to the whole inspiration for this book, which I'm sure I'll be able to get into later if... Uh, what time today? <laughs> Two o'clock, Yorkshire three. <laughs> yes. But, uh, yeah, that, that's pretty much the, the direction that I went for poisons and, and my understanding of it. And it's quite a fascinating, if scary, really, really scary sort of field to research. And, again, I'll be talking to my therapist very soon. <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll change direction quite a bit, actually. Um, so if you wanted to kill somebody, I would suggest you uh, use a drug they're already taking and that you do it in a rural setting. <clears throat> so not, not to disparage rural police officers in any way, but generally they're overworked and don't have as much experience. And so if you're going to slip something under the radar, the more rural, the better it would be. You do know this is being recorded, right? Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right, just um, <clears throat> So we'll just talk about a number of different medications that patients might take. One is narcotics. So that's, that's not commonly prescribed. Generally speaking, that'd be prescribed to um, cancer patients who have incredible pain. Um, that's not to say that somebody might, not want, might want to get rid of a cancer patient. So certainly, the reason I say medications they're already taking is if somebody overdoses on a medication they're already taking, that's less suspicious than somebody dying from a drug they've never taken before. So it does help. I'm purely speaking as if we were writing a novel here for no other reason. Um, so um, uh, that, that would be the, su the suggestion. Um, I, did find the fentanyl that fentanyl in Russia was in uh, Moscow in two, October 2002 was when they aerosolized the fentanyl. So if you want to look that one up, was that? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. What was the movie? Yeah. That's that's, that's the the trivia pursuit question. Yes. That. Um, so of the nar the narcotics, an overdose of narcotics causes respiratory depression. So depending on the dose, fairly quickly you you stop breathing. Um, morphine is considered the baseline medication, so a normal dose would be somewhere between 2.5 and 5 milligrams. Fentanyl, on the other hand, is 100 times more powerful, so you need a lot less of it to have the same effect. Therefore, an overdose on fentanyl wouldn't take a lot of medication. Um, the other drug that's, uh, that's in the news a fair bit right now is... Uh, is oxycodone, so a painkiller more commonly known by its trade name as Oxycontin, which is Percocet, Percodan, essentially, are the medications. The Oxycontin um, is popular because it releases over 12 hours. So you get 12 hours of pain relief, unless you chew it, in which case you get the entire effect almost immediately. So one of the fastest routes of a drug into your system is the mucosa in your mouth. 
So drugs are rapidly absorbed, rapidly absorbed into the system. So if you, you chew the tablet, crunch it, it will be absorbed very quickly. Thus, the overdoses, because it's, it's a lot of medication meant to be given over 12 hours, when you chew it, you're taking all of it at one point in time. So that can cause the overdose. And certainly if you take more than one pill, that just makes it happen faster. Um, other medications that are relatively common is a group called benzodiazepines. And essentially, the most common one is Valium. So in some circles known as mummy's little helper. Um, so not, un not uncommonly prescribed. Um, the challenge is that most drugs are prescribed in sufficient quantities to ensure an adequate overdose. Um, certainly physicians don't want you coming back every week to renew your prescription. Um, so generally speaking, um, you get a fair number of the pills and if you take them right away, you've got enough to do an overdose, which is unfortunate. There, oh, so just back to narcotics. So emergency departments, paramedics have an antidote for the, any of the narcotics, narcotics being morphine, demerol, fentanyl, heroin, codeine, oxycodone. And the antidote is a drug called um, naloxone Narcan. Now, the interesting thing with that is that naloxone is not as powerful as the narcotic. So it will reverse the effect for a short period of time, but if there's sufficient narcotic in the system, the patient or person will go into respiratory arrest again. Um, the next one, which uh, Aaron mentioned briefly, is, is a group of drugs called neuromuscular blockers. Now, no patient is taking those at home. Neuromuscular blockers are used in surgery or um, for procedures being done. And what it does is completely blocks and stops the nervous system from sending out any signals to your muscles. So every single muscle in the body is paralyzed. So the most common, um, well, maybe not common, but curare uh, as the poison dart is fairly well known. And then um, there's a number of different medications, vecuronium, rocuronium, uh, succinylcholine, are all neuromuscular blockers that are used within the hospital, pre-hospital care situations. But when that is given, succinylcholine will have its effect within about 30 seconds. And every muscle in the body is paralyzed. Now some of you may have seen an episode of Criminal Minds where a lady took girls in and dressed them up as dolls and they sat at the table and they were paralyzed but still sitting at the table. Well, this is where fact and fiction cross lines because the primary muscle for us to breathe is our diaphragm. And if a neuromuscular blocker is given, there is no muscle in your body that is working. So they can't be conscious, well they could be conscious for a minute, um, but they would have stopped breathing immediately when that was administered. So you can't keep somebody alive on a neuromuscular blocker be unless you're, they're on a ventilator because every muscle isn't going to work. So that's always the challenge, I suppose, in writing, is deciding where is the line between sticking to exactly what's fact and spinning off and having my own direction on this. So I suppose, ideally, you create a fictitious drug that does what you want it to do. Or you have a chemist friend or something, or the kids created it in high school chemistry class. Or Wait, oh, no, that's a different movie, different show. Um, <laughs> Question? Is uh, Sorry, what's that? Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, in sufficient, in sufficient doses, Rohypnol will lead to a loss of consciousness, and then a couple things happen. One is you vomit, or the dose is so high that the respiratory drive kicks out. Kicks out. And so, I mean, essentially, I guess the good side is you're unconscious first before you stop breathing. The, the cruelest thing you could really do to somebody would be to give these neuromuscular blockers to them while they are conscious. And so they would know that they were paralyzed, they would know they couldn't breathe and would 
be very aware of that. So in hospitals, we give, or pre-hospital care, we give other medications. So we go back to the benzodiazepines. We give Valium-like medications first. So that's kind of a sedative hypnotic. You're not aware of what's going on. And then we would give the neuromuscular blocker prior to the procedure. Um, other drugs, it just amazes me how they, uh, Michael Jackson and propofol, I mean, there is, there, is, there is no outside of hospital use for that drug. How he ended up with that at home, that's a, essentially, a, again, a hospital procedure drug. But when you're rich and famous, I guess you, can, you have access to almost anything. Um, if you want to kill somebody pretty quick, the drug would be potassium chloride which is actually one of the drugs in lethal, in, uh, lethal injection. Um, people believe that, well, if you eat lots of bananas, that will mask, mask the fact that they've taken potassium chloride. Well, I think you would have to eat like seven banana trees worth of bananas to match what would be a lethal dose of potassium chloride. So that's, that's um, it's more difficult to detect because it's naturally occurring in the body. But when the test came back and it was off the charts, then that would be, that would be a flag. Um, then as I mentioned, patient medication. So um, patients may be on heart medications. There's a couple of medications that are used to slow down a heart rate. So somebody has ongoing rapid heart rate, you, you wanna slow that down. So they would be on two types of drugs, either beta blockers or calcium channel blockers. And what those drugs do is essentially pull the heart rate down and keep it at a fairly steady rate. The bad thing about that is if they're stressed or there's some kind of trauma, the mechanism for the heart to compensate is gone because they're on that medication. So theoretically, somebody on beta blockers and calcium channel blockers, um, if you were starting to overdose them, there's the possibility you could literally scare them to death because they wouldn't be able to comp compensate for the fright or the scare. That's theoretical, so somebody wants to explore that and, and cross the line between, you know, facts and fiction, that would be okay. Um, and then there's street drugs. And we really, really, really don't have enough time to cover all of the street drugs. Um, but the, the biggest thing to know with, with street drugs is whatever they say they are, they're not. So if you think you're getting heroin, you're probably getting heroin, and they may have cut it with strychnine, they may have cut it with icing sugar, they may have cut it with baby powder. Um, there's also drugs on the street now that are called bath salts, which unfortunately this is being recorded and I can't say what I really think it is. Um, it's a whole bunch of crap. And it's a whole bunch of bad chemicals put together that each batch is almost different than the other one. Um, they sell them on the street having no clue what effect they're going to have. Now, on a purely marketing standpoint, putting out a drug that kills your clients can't make a lot of sense, but um, it's happening. We went through a spout, a spurt of that, I guess it was about a year, year and a half ago here in Calgary. Um, Eastern US, Vancouver as well, it seems to have calmed down uh, a little bit now. So unfortunately, maybe economics ruled over ethics at, at that point. Um, but, but those drugs are, are, are terrible. Um, and the challenge in treating them is, at, at least if I know that it's a heroin overdose, I know how to treat that. If I know it's a Valium overdose, I know how to treat that. These bath salts, you don't even know what, what's in it. So you, you treat symptoms and hope that that's going to be good, un, good enough. But obviously you can't administer an antidote because uh, you just don't know. Um, and, and then any of the, uh, oh, the party drugs, the, the rohypnol, ecstasy, um, methamphetamine. I mean, the other challenge with some of these drugs is, is so the bath salts and methamphetamine are almost instantly addictive. So you take methamphetamine once, chances are you're addicted. Other drugs take longer periods of time. So painkillers, a lot of people, not, some people become addicted to painkillers. You know, that happens over time. Uh, going to the hospital because, uh, because you have a broken ankle and them giving you Demerol or morphine will not make you an addict. And it won't make you an addict probably in the three or four days you're in hospital. Where the addiction comes is generally when you're sent home with a bottle of Tylenol 3s or 4s and you kind of get used to that.
question. Um, there's been a lot in the news recently about <coughs> buying uh, legal synthetic cannabis, and it's, it's killing news, doesn't mean people just could be wrong buying it, but it's killing quite a lot of people mm. uh, by the price of comparison to other things. What's in it that's doing that? That's a really good question, and I <laughs> don't have the answer. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, well, is, I guess it, where where is this happening? Is this happening in Washington or Colorado or other places? In the UK. In the UK, okay. Hmm. Yeah, I, I, I guess just off the top of my head, the challenge would be that that if if you're buying something synthetic that they're trying to say is legal in an area where it's not, then you don't know what it is. So for example, in, in Washington state and in Colorado, I mean, there's very strict guidelines about growing marijuana. There, there is in Canada as well for medicinal purposes. There's very strict rules about what fertilizers you use. You can't spray all this sort of stuff. Um, what set me off was as soon as you said the word synthetic. So as soon as you're saying that, then you're mixing some sorts of chemicals together to, to try and simulate a naturally occurring effect. And as soon as you do that, with, without knowing exactly what those chemicals are, it almost sounds like it's, it's back to kind of the bath salts thing, that somebody has found a way to produce this buzz out of mixing these chemicals together will do it. And it's more harmful than been good, but th that, like I said, it's just a guess on my part. Is some of the things like potassium chloride or something which is naturally occurring in the body, what would uh, alert the investigators to, to start looking for those substances in the dead person? Um, well, in the autopsy, because they were they were on potassium chloride, so that might not be a test that would always be done, but because they're on it, they would do the test to see. So they would be looking to see for the circumstances. So does this look like it was a natural death? Does this look like it potentially could have been a suicide? Um, and then depending on how suspicious the first officers are, uh, we, we've talked about, you know, three motivations is love, money, and revenge. Um, and so the first thing as an officer you kind of would look at is who stands to benefit. If, if you were questioning the death, who stands to benefit? And there's your first suspect. So you might take it a little farther. Um, not everybody who commits suicide leaves a suicide note. Um, I don't know of anybody who would trust a suicide note that was printed on a computer. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, if there was a note in handwriting, then you might accept that. But, but you would still take it a little farther just to make sure. So, um, you know, who else has access? Are, are they caring for themselves? Is there somebody who lives in the house? How long have they looked after them? So it's kind of, we, we talk about a thing called index of suspicion. And, you know, sometimes... Um, and even as a paramedic, you don't know what's going on, but it just doesn't pass the smell test. Your, your gut's just saying, this, this just isn't right, and you don't know why, so then you just look further. I don't know if that answered your question, hopefully. Yeah. Okay, go there and here. What about any dead plants? Sorry? Plants. Plants? Oh yeah, I, I mean, you know, lots of I didn't I didn't cover those for sake of time, but I mean, there, there's lots lots of plants that are that are good plants. And one of the drugs that's used to help somebody who has a slow heart rate that you want to speed up is called atropine, and uh, and, and comes from a plant. Um, so there's there's good plants that have been made into medications. There's also poisonous plants, which is which is outside my area of expertise or information, but. I know that uh, eat the wrong plants in the forest and you'll, you'll get really sick. If I, if I knew what a hemlock tree was, I wouldn't eat anything from the <laughs> hemlock tree. There's actually a lot that can kill you in the forest. I mean, you know, you have to be very, very well trained to be able to survive for any length of time on any of the plants that live out in even BC. Or, or any place with with a lot of trees and a lot of mushrooms and and other whatnot, um, there are plants that you can actually buy at uh, Home Depot that you know obviously aren't meant for human consumption. But if you were, 
you know there's there's barks that can do some crazy stuff there's uh, shrubs and flowers that can do some crazy stuff and these were all decorative plants obviously but they produce uh, berries in some cases uh, you'd have to eat a lot of them for the kind that you actually want to import into the city you know there's nothing so deadly that you eat two or three berries that are growing on a front lawn and suddenly you keel over dead but there's a lot of stuff out there that can hurt you uh, plant wise I know I know that the birds out front of my house get absolutely drunk on the um, berries from the Ketone Aster hedge in the fall outside my house so there's a Ferments a little bit, yeah. Alcohol poisoning. Yeah. yeah. Oh, there you go. Uh, sorry. The Topical. And then we'll come to the back. Are there people who are naturally immune to Um, One of the things that was mentioned with uh, mithridatism is that sometimes, like, it would probably have to be the mother. I'm, I'm pretty certain it can't just be the father, but... Uh, if the mother is engaging in this type of activity, there is actually a certain amount of immunity that the baby picks up just naturally as a matter of course, same like the mother is doing. Now, because of how long it takes for you to develop immunity for something like this, I'm not sure if nine months would be able to cut it. You know, you wouldn't want to poison yourself too drastically, and there's all, obviously all sorts of damages that could be done to uh, an unborn child in those cases. But um, it's it's been spoken of as being possible. I just don't know if... We're wanting to test that out nowadays. Rasputin, absolutely. It's the assumption is that the who was an oncologist used himself as so many poisons that he had high tolerance. Actually, if you do a search on uh, mithridatism, you you find out that he's one of the links for further reading, just because so many people suspect because he was reported to have been poisoned while at dinner, at, you know, the, the classic assassination attempt where uh, that didn't work, so they stabbed him and then they shot him and they rolled him up into a rug and they threw him in the river, at which point he died from drowning. So it's like, okay, well, why did none of these work? Maybe he's a werewolf. We don't really know. But, but at the same time, I mean, the fact of the matter is he was reportedly able to survive a poisoning that should have been able to kill him outright and there's obviously some sort of something at play there so yep Are you familiar with a situation where somebody doesn't have? Yeah, I, I'm. I'm not sure about that. I, I mean, certainly in some respects it makes sense in that a lot of the medications we take, the medications we take, need need the activation. So it's it's in the tablet, it's inactive. It's not until it it's in our body system that it becomes activated. And that can be in the stomach, that can be in the liver, that can be in the kidney. So essentially, uh, on the first pass of the medication through your system, nothing happens because it's not activated yet. I think we got time for one more. Um, you pick. Oh, well, let's, let's get back. Can you find the body? Well, the only way with it, without the body, you would have to have body fluid of some kind. So, whether that's blood, whether that's saliva, I suppose potentially tears. I'm not a forensics guy, um, but any 
any body fluid could be analyzed for um, any any of the drugs known. So um, blood would be best. Saliva would probably be next best. If it was uh, uh, slow poisoning, maybe hair. If you could yeah, find on a yeah, 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 actually, yeah, yeah. yeah. Long, longer poisoning, yeah, because your I don't know if everybody knows your your hair is uh, is a map of what you've done for however long your hair is. So I don't have much of a map, but uh, some, of the, some of the ladies here, we, we can tell what you've been doing for the last 10 years or so. So, you, um, yeah, so, I mean, they can analyze it bit by bit by bit by bit. So if there was a poisoning over time, that would show up in the hair. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think that's actually all the time that we've got now. So. Yeah. Well, well, quickly one more. Somebody could find a bond. Which yeah. chemicals do you track? Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's not in my. Uh, if somebody has bought uh, several barrels of hydrofluoric acid and been watching Breaking Bad, <laughs> I'd say that's a definite possibility. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, thanks. Thank you. Thanks very much for being here.